My name is Paul Beck, and I'm the chair of the uh, Emeritus Academy Steering Committee. And I want to welcome you to the seventh of our eight Emeritus Academy talks. Uh, we scheduled this one in the spring so that we would have really good weather out there. And there is sun, uh, but if you stand in a particular place on the oval, the wind will sweep you to high street, so be careful. Uh, the final talk, by the way, is the first Wednesday in, in May, and that's May the 2nd, and that's Jackie Wood, whose title is The Second Brain in the Gut, uh, and I'm very interested in hearing what that means, actually, uh, so I invite you to come for that talk. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the College of Arts and Sciences Digital Media Studio for videotaping this lecture, and it's videotaped all the others in the series. Uh, and in several weeks, it'll be posted on the website, the Emeritus Academy website, where it will join the videos from the other talks. And so if you want to go over the talks in the past, including the one today, and prepare for the May 2nd exam on this, uh, you'll want to make sure that you pay attention to the website itself. Well, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, and that's Mary Jo Fresh. Uh, she is a professor emeritus of education, from the Department of Teaching and Learning, came to Ohio State University in 1995. She currently is an OAA faculty fellow for the University Institute of Teaching and Learning. She's published many books and articles, 19 books alone for teachers, I believe, uh, and many of them are focused on reading and spelling, uh, which I should read, probably, <laughs> to make sure that I know what I'm doing. Uh, Beginning in 1999, she was the director for the study abroad program at the Thomas Jefferson School in Concepcion, Chile. Uh, she also writes a very interesting blog called the Fresh Ideas blog uh, at, OS, at u.osu.edu slash fresh.1. Uh, I wish I had Googled it uh, before discovering, or read it before I Googled her. Uh, because I would have picked up all kinds of tips from her most recent blog, our most recent entry. Today she will talk to us about the value of study abroad. Uh, I told her I, I had promised blaring trumpets to introduce her, uh, but I may just be reduced to humming a few bars, though I will actually not do that and save you from, the, from, from hearing me. But again, Mary Jo, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. for my name. I'm going to have to have you. Thank you. We did not get the little. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, so let me begin with a story. Hmm. Let's try it again. Oh. PC and it's a Mac. <laughs> so Mark stopped me in the hallway, tears running down his cheeks. He couldn't figure out how to heat the get the hot water tank going to have a shower that morning. He was trying to remember enough high school Spanish to communicate with his host family. And he missed home. Could he call his dad and change his return ticket? He had been in Chile exactly 48 hours. And I said, um, no, I tell you, let's, tr let's just try to wait a little bit longer. He was definitely outside his comfort zone, which is why I've chosen that as my title today. Um, Mark was from a small farm outside of Marion and had never been very many places, had not been on an airplane, and found himself in Chile for a one-month stay living with a family. The headmaster and I both tried to convince him it'll get better, you'll get used to it. He said, no, nope, I want to call my dad. So we go down to the office. He said, stand here with me in case my dad wants to talk to you. Said, okay. So he gets his dad on the phone, and his dad says, I will quote since I could hear it. Believe me, the volume was <clears throat> such that I could hear it. No, I will not pay for the change. You will keep your butt in Chile. Man up and have a good time. And he hung up on him. <laughs> So <laughs> Mark didn't have a choice. So uh, it took a few weeks. He, he got his rhythm going for the school and home and uh, being the outsider in a culture. 
In the end, he told me he was really glad he stayed. He said he learned a lot about himself and being independent. So what I'm going to talk about today is the Chile Study Abroad Program. I'll uh, give you a little bit of the history of the program and the Ohio State Marion students who I took and who participated in it, the intent of that program and their immersion experience. And we'll talk a little bit about the big picture. Why is study abroad important and in particular for pre-service or teachers who have not yet started teaching in their own classroom? They've taken courses, they've done their student teaching, but they don't have their own classrooms yet and why being outside their comfort zones was so important. It made some real lasting impressions and the students did indeed learn a lot. So the history of the program, some of you may know um, Greg Tribitowski. Uh, he taught, just to give you a little background on the headmaster of the school, he taught junior and senior uh, school students for several years and got a doctorate then he began teaching graduate and professional students in the College of Education, and his career shifted when he was asked to become Associate Dean for Medical Education. So for 18 years, he served as the academic dean responsible for nearly 1,000 medical students. And during that time, he served as a consultant to a number of organizations, one of which was the Pan American Health Organization. And through his travel with that, he ended up in Chile, and um, decided that he, you know, he had some really interesting experiences with the Chilean people, and they were saying, you know, our children need to learn to speak English, um, and they would love to have a school that would be able to provide that. So when he retired, he moved to Chile, sold everything he had in Upper Arlington, moved down there, bought some land, and opened the Thomas Jefferson School in 1992. It started with the preschool and kindergarten, and then every year as those students moved up, another grade level was added to the school until in 2004, the first senior class graduated. And they had then the preschool to grade 12. Now the school is big enough and has enough employees that he had to provide daycare, so now he also has an infant section and the babies are there and they're teaching them English while they're also caring for the babies. So it's truly um, an immersion school. So a couple years after he got it started, he came back, he has family back here, he's back visiting, and Greg made uh, an appointment with the then Dean of the College of Education, Nancy Zimfer. And he said, how about offering an immersion experience for pre-service teachers? They would be models of English language users. They could interact with the children, interact with the teachers. They could bring some teaching ideas. Let's get, let's get something going. So Nancy Zimfer passed him off to uh, Jerry Zutel, who was um, in the College of Education, and asked him to create this program for the Columbus campus students. So in 95, that's what Jerry did. Many years before that, Jerry had been my doctoral advisor. So um, I started teaching in Marion in 95. A few years later, he approached me and said, why don't you start offering this to the Marion campus students? So in 99, I became a faculty director um, for the pre-service teachers in Marion. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with geography, but I'll just kind of give you a, a quick uh, Santiago, of course. Um, and then if you fly south, you'll come to Concepcion. Um, as a faculty director, one of the things I did too is I traveled with the groups, so at, I would tack on at the end some personal travel and got to see some pretty amazing places in Chile. Of course, Rapa Nui or Easter Island, um, Patagonia, uh, the Straits of Magellan. I give a big shout out to Magellan because when you stand there and look at that map, how he navigated through there and didn't get lost is amazing. Uh, Punta Arenas, which is the most southern city. Um, and if you fly east or fly west from Santiago, 2,300 miles, that's where you will get to Easter Island. It takes six hours to get there, and Chile does own it, and it's pretty far out there. You might have heard of Concepcion, actually, because it had a lot of world attention in 2010. In February of that year, there was an 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake that lasted for nearly four minutes. It was just off of the shore of Concepcion that was considered the epicenter. Um, and it did a lot of destruction. When we got to Concepcion a few months later, we were still seeing buildings like you see up at the top left where they just 
you know, broken half where there was still a lot of debris. The bottom picture is from Takawana, which was a shipbuilding port that is by Concepcion, and the ships were picked up by the tsunami and carried into the city. Um, that whole part, port had to be rebuilt. And interestingly, the people who were kind of up into the mountain areas and had not been affected by the tsunami, many of those people just came down into the cities to start helping with the cleanup. They just said, this is our country, this is our, our economy, we need to help these people. And so the port got rebuilt fairly quickly. Um, one of the interesting points about it in relationship to the Thomas Jefferson School was the military had approached uh, Greg to see if they could house their men there while they were providing security and helping with the cleanup. The school is enclosed with fencing and they could bring in fuel and water and what the military would need and it would be safe. There was also large areas like the um, auditorium and the gymnasium where they could put cots so the men could sleep there. So Thomas Jefferson became the base for the military. Um, his school is very well known in the country. The American ambassador often comes down to visit. He's been asked to come to Santiago to talk about his model for the immersion school. And many more immersion schools have um, begun because of the model that he has provided. So we all went to, to Concepcion, we left, then in August another bit of world attention came to, um, to Chile itself. In August of that year, uh, there were 33 miners who were trapped 2,300 feet underground when a rock the size of the Empire State Building shifted. And this was a copper and gold mine they were working in, and they, the company tried many ways to drill to find a way that they could reach the men. It lasted 69 days. A Houston-based drilling company finally came to Chile with this capsule that you see in the left-hand corner. They sent that down and finally were able to drill down into the rock and send this capsule and one man at a time would come up. They would send down um, Oakleys because they had, of course, had been in the dark for so long that um, they did the rescue, if you see, at night so that their eyes wouldn't be damaged from coming up. The man in the middle, um, Mario Supluvida, who Hank, my husband, who comes to all the talks with me, I had to give him a little shout out here, ran into him in the airport. A year after this happened, the, many of the men were in the United States speaking about their experience and talking about mining safety and various things. And Hank was on his way down meeting me. I think we were going to Easter Island on that trip and met all of these men were in the Houston airport with him as well. And so he got to have his picture taken with him. Um, and they made the movie The 33. If you haven't seen it yet, it's it's very interesting movie and very moving. And Antonio Banderas played Mario. They, they nicknamed him Super Mario because he's sort of the, pe the guy that kind of kept everybody together and helped them you know, think we're going to get rescued. We have to, we have to keep positive. And um, it's, a, it's a great movie if you want a little, also a look kind of into Chilean uh, culture and how the families reacted and, and how it all worked out. So the program. The Ohio State Marion students. These were all fifth year MED teacher education licensure students. So what that meant was they all had a four year degree of some sort. If they were gonna be a middle school mathematics teacher, they probably had a mathematics degree. And then they would come to us for the fifth year and they would do their uh, licensing courses that the state would require for them to be a licensed teacher. So methods courses, child development, and of course the student teaching. Um, so there, uh, there were 15 groups that went. The size of the groups ranged from six up to 15. On a study abroad like this, it's always nice if you can get at least 10 travelers because then you can get a discount from the airline for the flights, which is always helpful for the students. Um, when we offered this to them, the students were not required to speak Spanish. And this is just gives you a picture of some of the groups that went. As you can see, we have you know, we have many, some mature age students at our campus. Some of these people that went had children of their own. There's a variety of ages in the group. And uh, so you can see kind of how the variety of those groups looked. Uh, the Marion campus did help some by providing grants to cover some of the expenses. So any student uh, who successfully completed student teaching could participate. About 85% of our students would get some kind of tuition ex 
um, assistance, either through fate, uh, federal and state, you know, financial aid. Um, the dean and director, Greg Rose there, and he's still there, is, is really committed to helping students with these experiences and so found various ways to uh, fund it. We also found ways to help fund ourselves. I went and spoke to the Rotary many times and um, was able to squeak some money out of them. Uh, the students did things like bake sales, fundraisers, three and three basketball competition tournament where teams had to pay and then they would, whatever money was made, they would split evenly between all the travelers. Uh, the trips were either in March, which was good because that was their, uh, the end of their summer and uh, or July which was always rainy but we always had a work around when the students were finishing their student teaching so as faculty director I traveled with 11 of the 15 groups and this is this scene by the ocean is near Takawana the beaches are black sand and the water is beautiful it's you take them there like early in the trip and then they know they've really gone to paradise um, I would stay for seven to ten days. So I'd get them started, make sure they were settled in their classroom, make sure they were settled in their f homes with their families. And then I would also be providing professional development workshops for the teachers. Um, this is a handout I made. I was talking about concept mapping. So I sent it down ahead of time. Someone at the school translated it into Spanish so the teachers could have it side by side. Although they are required to speak English, they of course are always improving their English and they're also improving their, you know, their, their professional language, the kind of like concept mapping and the kinds of strategies that we might have the students doing. So um, we would try to spend some time thinking of some new strategies for the classroom and ideas that they could use then in their own teaching. The uh, students were assigned by the headmaster then to classrooms associated with their licensure. So if they were going to be a K-3 to classroom teacher, then that's the, the classroom assignment they got. If they were going to teach, let's say, middle school science, then they got a middle school science placement with the intent that they would team teach with the teachers at Thomas Jefferson. So part of that was to uh, work together with the other teacher. They had just come off of student teaching. They were kind of used to that idea of that professional dialogue and working with um, another teacher. And also it was to bring some new ideas to those teachers. The university experience for many of those teachers were lectures. So that's just how the university works. They would have a lot of lectures and they would be taking their coursework to be a teacher and have that as the most common way to be learning. They often turned that into the classroom and with very young children that's sometimes not quite the way to get, get attention, right? It's a lot of lecturing. So we would try to bring some new ideas. For instance, one of my students got all the kindergarten teachers together and she said, look, you really, one thing that'd be really great to do is to have some learning centers, which they didn't know about. And so she explained to them, you know, she would create an activity, the children would be in a small group, move to the learning center, do the activity and move around to maybe five different learning centers. Say one might be on numbers, one might be on alphabet. So colors, whatever would be appropriate curriculum wise for kindergartners. There was always the teacher, plus there was an aide in the classroom and then also my students. So with three adults, they could roam around, help the children learn how to navigate around the learning centers. Plus the teachers could watch the t children and get a lot of assessment information as they're working in these centers and the teachers in the kindergarten are still using those learning centers to this day because they loved it. It was, it was active, the kids were up and moving, and it was much more appropriate for what they were trying to do with their kindergartners. So we felt good that we brought in some new, new ideas. And these are just some classroom pictures of students with their various placements. So the intent of the program, there was really two compelling reasons for offering this study abroad to the Marion pre-service teachers that I felt very strongly about. One was to provide some diverse personal experiences outside their usual support systems of, of home. Uh, Marion campus does not have dorms. So many of the students live at home. And then of course we have the mature age students who are at home because you know, they have their families. So there is not that same kind of experience of living somewhere where there's a lot of people different from you. Um, and I wanted to really broaden their cultural um, understandings. The Marion campus population itself is primarily white. 
and there are smaller numbers of three ethnicities that they report. So there is the diversity, it's starting to get more so, but it's still not that much diversity that the students would even see in their coursework there. Uh, many of the OSU Marion students reside in the local area, which according to the U.S. Census Bureau is 91% white. About 1% of the population surrounding uh, the campus is what the Census Bureau calls foreign born. And a second language is spoken in only 3.5% of the homes. So even in growing up in that area, they haven't had much opportunity for diversity. But many of these students are going to want to come back and get jobs in districts that have different demographics than what they've grown up in. So they might go to Olentangy schools, Dublin schools, Columbus City schools, Westerville, where there's more diversity in a classroom, but that's not the experience they've had growing up. So I felt strongly about trying to provide that opportunity for my students to uh, have more diverse experience. Now the host families where they lived for the month um, they volunteered their house. They, the school would let them know that they, we were coming and who would like to have a student. They would feed them. They would agree to transport them to the school. There aren't any school buses. Um, and um, also around the city if they needed to, to be somewhere. No financial support was offered to the families. This was totally volunteer. And as with our students, there was no language proficiency expectation in the family. Um, the Thomas Jefferson student might be the only one in the household who spoke English, and if that child was in first grade, they might not have much English. Mark's problem, if you think back to Mark, that was what happened where he was. It was a very young child who had limited English, and he had even more limited Spanish. So that was a little bit of a problem those first nights. So I had some pre-trip meetings with them. I think it's important to get them, get their mind about what they need to do, what they need to expect, get them prepared. Um, there were requirements. Uh, this, these were master's students, so they'd have to come back and write a capstone project. And so we talked about that. They needed to select some topic of interest to them. And I'll give you some sample topics later on. But you know, what's of interest to you? They would look at that during their student teaching time and then look at it in the Thomas Jefferson placement and then they would compare what they found um, about the particular topic they had chosen. Um, I, uh, the Office of International Education then offered us a handbook to give the students kind of an idea, oh, the first, first week you might feel this, I mean, kind of the research behind being in a study abroad program. And they would give them some country information about Chile. Um, we, and then it was also a time for me to gather some baseline information about the travelers through a pre-trip survey. We would also talk about what we could take to the school. Sometimes Greg would order things. I know one year we took down 10 microscopes. So it was a random draw who got to put that in their suitcase. And, and then they're all like, oh, it's going to take up space in my suitcase. I, yeah, but whatever space you take out, you can put something in. So that was usually my selling point. We often, uh, one of my students contacted Scholastic Books and got a $400 donation in books. So that was, we passed out, about everybody had to figure out how to take down, I don't know how many books we had, but it was great of Scholastic to do that. I said, get a lot of paperbacks because we got to carry them down. Um, we would bring some school supplies, uh, whatever we thought we could, you know, the school needed whiteboard markers and that sort of thing. We would just bring them with us. It was sort of our gifts to the school as well as bringing chocolates to the family. If there were small children, maybe coloring books and crayons that they could give to the children. So, this was the survey, and I'll give you all the questions that I asked the students. First of all, I asked them about their pre, uh, previous destinations outside the United States, and I asked them to tell me where and what they did. So just in, and on all of these, I'll just try to give you a, an overview. I've co I collected the journals over the years and have kind of an overview for you of how those groups responded to these. About 10% of my students had been out of the country. And a few of those were students who maybe went to Europe with their families, but most of them would say things like, oh, I've been to Niagara Falls, I've been to Cancun on spring break, and, and you're thinking, no, that's not really a cultural experience, but okay, you were out of the country. And that was, that was my question, is how traveled they were. Um, asking them what languages they spoke other than English, 
I would get high school French or Spanish, but a lot of them would say they weren't proficient in it, they didn't remember it, and some of the students it had been so long since they took it, they really just don't remember it. And out of all the years, all the groups that went, I only had one student who was proficient in Spanish. The rest of the students would say little or none for their knowledge of Spanish. So I said, well, what do you, the next questions, and they, they were writing about these, so. I, what do you think you're going to learn about the culture, about teaching children and yourself? So I got things like I learn about the daily life, I'll learn about food, religion, traditions, a lot of the surface things that we, I think that we deal with in schools when we say, oh, it's Cinco de Mayo, so we're going to have tacos. It's that sort of surface uh, attributes of a culture that happen in a lot of the school instruction, and so I wanted to try and get them past that, but it was obvious to me that's kind of where they, their thinking was when, before they went. A lot of them wondered about the bilingual setting. Like, how did that work for the children if they were learning Spanish, learning English, and also having to learn content? And um, the children, they just wondered how it worked for them to be in a, the school, where they, you know, how is this teaching, is, how do we keep children engaged in this teaching to learn English while they're also Spanish speakers and trying to learn their content? A lot of them were unsure about what they were gonna learn about themselves. Some of them thought, ah, oh, I think I'll learn to be more independent. That was a good guess. So then I asked them, well, what do you think you're going to miss about home? Um, what do the families think, you know, what do you think they're going to learn about people like us? And uh, what are you worried about? So they thought they would miss their dog, their spouse, and, and sometimes they actually wrote it in that order. <laughs> I miss my dog, I miss my spouse, I miss my parents, a girlfriend. Um, they thought the Chilean people would find that and they, this was a quote, Americans are nice, or they were fun-loving people. So that was what they thought they were going to present to their, to their host families. The things they worried about were getting sick. They were worried about the food. They were worried about the water. And, and a lot of them did worry about being homesick because they just had not been away. So other pre-trip topics included packing. You can see how successful I was. Um, <laughs> I would give them like the weather expectations. If you're going in July, it's going to rain. Don't worry about your fashion shoes. You need things that are going to stand up to the, you know, to the weather. Uh, the school attire, Greg's li liked uh, the students to wear um, Ohio State gear so the children would know that we, who, who the visitors were and the children would come right up to them and try to practice their English. So it was kind of, uh, the first few days we always made sure we had some Ohio State gear on, sweatshirts or t-shirts or something so that the, the children would know we're the visitors. And I would talk about weight limits. This was our driver in Santiago. You can tell how thrilled he is. And I have to give him credit. I, I think it's, that that's like a real skill to pack that van and got all our suitcases in. Uh, so I said, you have to sit there because I have to take your picture. So the other thing we talked about was registering with the State Department and I talked to them about how this isn't a bad idea when you're on other trips. So let the State Department, especially in a country for a while um, and they were, since they were going to be there for a month, it turned out to be very helpful for us. Um, we were in Santiago staying at a hotel. We stopped in a couple of days there and did a tour of the city before going on to Concepcion. And the State Department contacted me uh, they also had called the hotel to, because we had our itinerary listed to make sure that we had gotten the information. There was going to be a demonstration at the U.S. Embassy, which was down a couple of blocks from us, and they told us they did not want us walking down there to stay away from there. They said nothing will probably happen, but there is no point in being down there, so you, we want you to be safe. Uh, the other thing, of course, is being an American visitor, you know, how you conduct yourself in another country. And um, I had one young man who was very loud and boisterous, and we got on the city bus, and I had to say, Jared, you got to just turn the dial down, because every single person in the bus is looking at us with our big American accents, and they know we're the visitors, and um, it's, just, it's just being cognizant of your surroundings. The picture you see on the right, um, the, there's a wonderful place in, in Santiago, uh, Los Domingos, which has got all local artisans, and I always take the students down there. We get on the metro, so we've ridden the public transportation, which is something that many of them have not done before. And we go down, and there's music, and there's food, and there's 
um, just all kinds of artisans. It's just a really beautiful place to take them and kind of get them around families. And, and we go on a Sunday, it's just, it's a, or a Saturday, and it's just a lot of fun. We got back on the metro to go back to the hotel, and these police officers, who you can't see, but they have rifles hanging over their other shoulders, these police officers got on the metro with us. So everybody's panicked, and I just, just everybody be calm and sit down. I just told the person across from me, take a picture of us. <laughs> me, Josh, lean that way so we can get the police officers in the picture. Every stop, the doors would open, they would step out, and people on the car would get off, but oddly, no one else ever got on. <laughs> and so we used every stop along the way. Pretty soon, we're the only people on this car of the Metro. And when I got back to the hotel, I asked about it. Um, an American had been mugged on the Metro two weeks earlier. They did not like that as bad publicity for their tourism. And they said, those police officers saw us. We were a big group, as you can see on the left. They knew we were, you know, we were visitors. They were protecting us. So they just got on the metro and rode along with us, and we, we felt very, very safe. Um, I also would tell them a little bit about what to expect when they got to the school. The top right picture is the playground, so that's not going to look much like their playground. Uh, the top left is uh, the computer lab. Every square inch of that build, of those buildings are used. As he added grades, he had to add buildings, so the eaves, this was a, a computer lab. Uh, the bottom right, it's a kindergarten classroom, so it looks pretty much like home. That looks very similar to what a primary classroom would look like. But I, I love the one on the left because they were building a climbing wall on the outside of that building and it seemed to be okay to be over concrete steps and gravel ground. I don't, it's just the regulations are different. So I would just say, don't be surprised by what you see and try to understand, ask about that, you know? So that's where the climbing, I guess you, you become a good climber if you're hanging over steps and you don't wanna fall down on them. Um, the students were also advised of some cultural expectations, such as being a respectful house guest. Uh, this actually came from the school material that they sent the students. Chileans are warm and accepting people. Be prepared to be kissed on the cheek when first introduced and get over your personal space issue. <laughs> they obviously had experience with those of us that have personal space issues. And I would remind them, remember, just because it looks like home, this is the mall. And it, it looks, it's very modern and it just absolutely looks like you could be walking into any mall in Columbus but remembering that there's different ways that you do business in these shops. And they were surprised when everything was so beautifully wrapped and then handed to them like gift wrapped. And it was, they were like, gosh, why don't we do this at home? And, and the, the staff are so proud of their stores and how they, they provide service to you. It was a nice experience for the students. Um, and I would, of course, make the suggestions for the small gifts for the families. I also gave the students a Berlitz Spanish CD the campus bought a bunch of these so I could loan them out to the students. They got these little dictionaries, they're phrase books, and then there's um, actually a dictionary in the, you know, some major, not everything obviously, but the words that they might often need. And I told them to, you know, review the CD, which most of them did not do, and then, <laughs> because that's what students do, and then I gave them the, the dictionary. I said, at least take this with you. Uh, because if you're in a family, if you're in a home where there's not a lot of English and you need your need something done, you might have to rely on this to point to words. And uh, many of them said it was a lifesaver. So we all flew together to Santiago. Um, we would stay the first two days. I found it was really important to create some cohesiveness in the group. We used to do it at the end of the trip, but they're so exhausted at the end of the month and they're dragging these 900 pound pieces of luggage behind them and they, to go to a hotel they just were ready to go home so we I flipped it around and we'd go to Santiago first we could tour the city it's a beautiful city and uh, kind of create some cohesiveness in the group because they were going to be living and working together for a month the families met us at the airport so we had to send photos of their you know this is your this is Mark and the families would make these giant posters with the pictures. They'd be welcome to, you know, and they'd be waving these on the other side of this glass thing. And, and it, it was chaotic and riotous and it was fun, but the students, sometimes it was a little overwhelming. But the students would get whisked away by their host family. And most of the, it was a Sunday, so most of the families would have a family cookout. 
and um, with 50 maybe of their closest family members. <laughs> and the students are, were always surprised by the size of the families, that this cousin and that aunt and that uncle and everybody just seemed so close. And that was something a lot of them didn't experience here. So it was, it was quite a whirlwind that first day. We also encouraged the students to travel, so on the weekends the school would help make some arrangements, um, zip lining, horseback riding, they did some kayaking, they, they went in a mine, um, they just, there was lots of things to do, there's a volcano, uh, the one year they went to the volcano and climbed it and um, the next morning it erupted and, the one, <laughs> yeah. And then the one student, it was towards the end of the trip, the one student had an email. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but the part of the volcano we were standing on yesterday isn't there anymore. I'm like, oh, I just don't know that. <laughs> yeah. um, but they had a wonderful time getting to see the opportunity, you know, it was the opportunity to see more than just being in the school every day, but to actually see the country. And um, they would try to get them English speaking tour guides so that they could learn about the places that they were going. I really wanted to them to get past this food and festival kind of viewpoint that we often have. Um, and I share this, what is called a cultural iceberg with them. You know, the part at the top, I know they're small and they're hard to see for you, but the things that we know most about a culture. But below is so much more, um, it, it's really that um, deep culture that we need to learn about. And, and families, things like multi-generational households, many of them hadn't experienced that and they were so surprised. One of the uh, families explained at length to a student that, listen, both of us work and if you have, if you both have jobs, it's up to you, it's actually on you to create another job. So they would have housekeepers, they'd have somebody coming in who would cook, that would do laundry, um, all of those kinds of things that was important in the culture because they were providing work for another person. The students had a really hard time with the housekeepers. That, that's, that was a recurring question in my part. Before. Like how do we, you know, how, I, I don't want them, they don't have to do my laundry. I said that's their job and you have to let them do what they're hired by the family to do. I had one student who was so freaked out about somebody else doing her laundry. Let's see, how can I put this? She bought 30 pairs of underwear so that no one she didn't know would be washing her underwear. And every day she'd put it in her suitcase and lock it. And I'm sure the housekeeper's like, what the heck, doesn't this girl wear underwear? <laughs> and so she got, finally one day she forgot to lock it. And the house came, and she came home from school and there were like two weeks worth on the bed and she was like, oh my gosh. And I said, so did, you know, did she say anything to you about, you know, the quality or the color or anything? I mean, she didn't care, right? She's the housekeeper. This is what she does. It, that, she's not taking it personally. But the guys would say, she ironed my boxers and they were folded so perfectly. They thought it was great. It was just a, such an experience for them that kind of broadened their ideas about, you know, creating work for people and appreciating the jobs that people did for them. So the big picture, why is it important? Taking pre-service teachers outside the cultural paradigm with which they are comfortable can enhance their ability to work with and learn from adults and children who are different from themselves. And some of you may know Mary Maryfield who was in education and she was you know, a real champion for multicultural education and broadening students' experiences and understandings is teachers really need to know that there is a different perspective in life besides the one maybe that they have. Um, such experiences can ensure that teacher education students have valid learning experiences rather than becoming educational tourists. And I really felt strongly about this immersion program because it's more than just a short version of I'm going to go into a foreign classroom, teach for a week, and then I've had a study abroad. It was the immersion experience that was so um, important for them to understand what it was like to learn and live in another culture. We find that many pre-service teachers lack empathetic knowledge of what our English language learners, school children are experiencing in the United States. However, if they've had a study abroad, they're more readily able to perceive inequalities and actually see themselves as change agents. An overseas teaching experience for pre-service teachers has immense benefit for the student so that disoriented you know, experience, think Mark, right? <laughs> disoriented experiences are a crucial first step 
for perspective transformation, yet the Institute of International Education reports that only 1% of teacher education students study abroad. So why outside their comfort zone was made some lasting impressions and why it was so important. We're going to go back to food. So I, sh I show you the van again because a lot of those cases were stuffed with things like Twizzlers and peanut butter crackers and Pringle cans. I just, because they were worried about being hungry, and what they found was the food was fantastic and they, they loved it. Um, the seafood, obviously, and this bottom picture, there was a restaurant down in the city that you could get 34 different stuffings for empanadas. And so they were taking a tour of all the different flavors. It just, they learned what it was like to have healthy, freshly made food, and they loved it. The outside the comfort zone, the McDonald's standing in line. This is again about get over your personal space. We were standing in McDonald's and the student kept saying, and this is at the mall, by the way, if you get the meal deal, you can get a beer. So that's just, <laughs> that's a whole different deal. Um, they were standing in line, the student kept complaining. She said, the people keep getting in front of me, they're so rude here. I said, they don't know you're in line. You have so much space between you and the person in front of you, they think you're just standing back and looking at the menu. You've got to step up. So we had to get over that issue of that this is a, this is personal space is a smaller distance. Um, or the laundry soap, soap story. One of the students, her family went away for the weekend, and she said, I'm, I'm just going to stay here. I've got some things for, to do for school. And she was one of my mature age students and had children of her own. And they said, oh, that's fine. If you want to stay here and make yourself at home, you know, you've already been here. So she decided she would do her own laundry. Well, she couldn't figure out the laundry soap, so she thought, well, I'll go to the grocery store. I know the context of laundry soap. I'll just go buy some soap and come back and do it. Well, it wasn't until all of her clothes or dark shirts came out of the washer with little white grains on it that she realized what she bought. And she says, what I didn't realize was until my dark shirts came out of the washer full of white flecks, I purchased sink cleanser, not laundry soap. While I had to laugh at myself, I suddenly realized how products with words but no pictures are impossible for a second language user. How does someone in the US stores buy soup? Words but no pictures. You know, for a long time, Campbell's only had those labels, and they're kind of moving now towards these labels that have pictures of the content. So it's kind of interesting. I don't know what that's a response to or if it's supposed to make you hungry, I guess. Um, the students then did have that capstone project. They came back and had a paper to write and a presentation to do. This is examples of some of the topics that they chose, things like classroom management strategies, reading aloud in the classroom, primary, showing the primary teachers how they would read aloud with the children. Um, how, do, how are parents involved? Is it different than American schools? It was. Um, comparing the technology use and um, looking at the second language users in early childhood classrooms. So we got to the post-trip survey. Same kinds of questions, like what, what's your current knowledge? Most of them said they were better, but they were very aware of the level of proficiency and called this little dictionary a lifesaver. Um, they realized that the language barrier was exhausting. One of the students said, how does an eight-year-old do this in our country? So they're just thinking, at the end of the day as an adult, they were so tired trying to get their needs met and communicating what they needed, and they could turn that around and think, wow, if I was eight, how would, how would this go for me? Uh, many commented about how much more sensitive they would be to the needs of their English language learners, students in their classrooms, and said things like, it's not just about speaking the language, it's also about understanding the culture. As far as the culture, they always wrote about the people being warm, loving, caring, and family-oriented. They, they lived that for a month with their host families. They were surprised and impressed by how many of the homes were multi-generational. Um, they found the teachers could be affectionate, and one of the students said, I somewhat envy their freedom to hug a child. They saw hugging as a way to discipline. Even parents use that. If, some, if a child was unruly, a teacher might just hug them. But the students knew coming back here to the United States, that's probably not an option for them to be hugging a lot of children. They talked about the children being undisciplined and spoiled. It's a, it's, and that was part of that deep culture, understanding the child rearing and how that works there and how that then plays out into the school. But they would say in the same turn, these adults grow up to be hardworking, caring adults. When does that switch happen? And they, they just, many of them said, I wish I could stay another month and figure that out because they really were impressed by what the adults, um, how the adults were so affectionate with the children, almost letting them 
you know, rather than reprimanding them, I'll just hug you. And um, so they found that was very different and found it really interesting part of the culture that they wouldn't have known otherwise unless they had been living there. Many of them, as far as themselves, they were a surprised at how they adapted. A few had their, you know, I just have to laugh at myself like the laundry soap. One of the students, when the group went horseback riding, he didn't quite understand. The stable hand was trying to get him not to pick the horse he did. And he thought, oh, maybe he thinks I'm inexperienced. So he's, eh, you know, and he just took the horse out and went out. Only when he returned did he realize why, because the stable hand then called the horse Diablo. And yeah, he was a devil of a <laughs> He tried to knock them off a lot. He's like, oh, okay, now I get it. Maybe I should have tried with communicating a little better. What they missed about home, their dogs, their spouses, again, in that or families, but they also missed their cars and their ability to just go wherever, whenever they wanted. Um, they missed their cell phones. They, many of them did not pay to have the SIM card and all it was expensive to do, they would get on Wi-Fi and FaceTime back home. So they were staying in touch with their families, but they said, I rediscovered wearing a watch because without their cell phones, they never knew what time it was. Um, they thought they about North Americans was that um, many talked about showing that we are not standoffish or snobby or loud or obnoxious, which was obnoxious, which apparently they found was an impression that the Chilean people had of some of the people from North America. Um, that they had these conversations that, well, you push your children out of your homes when they're 18 years old and you don't want them to come back and they're staying in these multi-generational homes. So they thought that was interesting. They were also surprised because they were always asked who they voted for. And they would get into these political conversations and they weren't comfortable with that. They, and some of them, they didn't know how to handle that because some of the questions were things here no one would ask them. But they were asked, so who did you vote for? What do you think of so-and-so? <laughs> so they had, a, they had a tough up and answer some of that. They said they were really proud, though, of their um, helping not only the Thomas Jefferson student learn better, you know, improve their English, but many of them, they found the families wanted to learn English. And so there was kind of a two-way street going on. They were learning more Spanish. Spanish, the family was learning more English, and they felt like a lot of learning occurred. They also learned to say North American. If they'd say, well, I'm an American, and they would look at them and go, well, we're American. We're South American. You are North American. You have to be specific. <laughs> they learned to call themselves North Americans. Uh, what did you worry about that you didn't need to? Many of them thought they were going to miss home, but they really talked about how many friendships they forged um, for a lifetime there, and that um, they really are, some of them are still in contact. That more than half the students noted that they worried about the flight. Dr. Fresh, I've never been on a plane. Can I sit next to you? Mm, no. Um, <laughs> but they had, they, felt like now they had a desire to do more traveling. They had gone to the long flight from Houston to Santiago, and really they, they figured out strategies and said, Tylenol PM is my friend. Um, they said they didn't have to worry about the food. They said they ate healthier than they did at home, and they really loved that. And they said, some of them said, I thought I was probably going to lose 10 pounds because I wouldn't be eating anything, and instead I gained a little bit. A week from, um, so that survey was done one week when they, after they got back, so everything was still fresh in their mind. And then they had a couple weeks to write a reflection paper and they could reflect on any part of the experience that they wanted to. So here's some examples. The experience provided me with a view of what our English second, as a second language students and their families face when they come into our communities and our schools. Another student said, I came to realize that the success of a school does not depend on all the stuff they have, but what goes on within the classrooms. I have more supplies in my desk at home than the teachers at Thomas Jefferson School have altogether. And I got this one a lot. I am forever changed. I am stronger than I thought. I can be out of my comfort zone and be okay. And this one was particularly um, rewarding for me. I was questioning if I still wanted to be a teacher. After participating in the study abroad, a Chile study abroad program, I can now honestly say I want to teach. I believe it enhanced my teaching ability and made me a better person. This trip truly changed my life. And then in December of 2016, I got this email from a 2005 traveler. I've spent a lot of time traveling over the years. I always attribute my need to see the world to the Chilean teaching experience. So when I say you had an impact, I truly mean it. I have now been to over 11 countries and just last summer helped lead a group of 25 students to Germany and the Netherlands as part of a travel experience based around human rights. 
The 11-day trip ended with a global leadership summit in The Hague. Hopefully, I'm building the same need to travel in my students as you did in me. And he is a, currently an eighth grade American history teacher in the Olentangy schools. He was named the 2016 Ohio Preserve America History Teacher of the Year. So he is uh, quite a dedicated teacher. And I always gave my pitch at the meetings for the students. I said, you know, my, I know my students love children and they were going to do the best they could. But I, and I didn't have any doubt that they were going to be good teachers, but I just wanted more for them. I wanted them to be more understanding, empathetic, and, and have the perspective of what some child coming into their classroom might be going through. So I give my final pitch. As Mark Twain could say, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the things you did do. And when the students return and agree that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity, and I'm really glad that all of them took it. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Paul? Rachel, they were there for a month. They were there for a month. Paul asked they were there for a month. Is a month a good period of time? Is it enough? Yeah. It, you know, it would be great if it could be longer. Um, you know, we were working, at the time we were working in the quarter system, so we needed to, it was part of the travel, and then be there a month, and then they had to come back and finish their capstones, and then they had, you know, and then graduation. I, I'll tell you, at that four week, it, it took about week three before they really started. The first two weeks was always a lot of disorienting kind of, acti you know, feelings. Week three, it kind of turned the corner and you could see it and they really started to, they were sad to leave by week four. They could probably have gone several more weeks. Um, but that was just, that was the time frame we could do. It, it, it was definitely the minimum I would do. Yes? Uh, I have a comment and a question. I know from being an associate dean in arts and sciences that in fact Ohio State at all campuses provides wonderful opportunities for undergraduate travel. We have um, with over 40 countries liaisons of various kinds for travel. Mm -hmm. We have an undergraduate general education language requirement, which does help to make them competent in language, culture, and geographic and historical context that enrich the experience. And most crucially, I think, Ohio State has worked out easy credit transfer for students who actually study in universities in other countries. Mm -hmm. And that is of crucial importance to their parents, that this be not just a frivolous, but a, a, some uh, graduation and Right, experience. yeah, this, because this course was their capstone course, right. so this was right. their credit, it's absolutely. It's important to do. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, but my question is, yeah. um, I don't know whether you were relatively rare among the Ohio State area education teachers in doing this, but what would you say were the uh, long-range particular benefits to the teachers leading with you? Uh, the teachers that... Like you. Oh, me? What's my long-term benefit for doing this? Uh, well, I think I had an impact on the profession, for one thing, because I think I, I think I made some real differences. I mean, my example of my eighth grade student who, or eighth grade history teacher who was my student, um, hopefully I helped students who would not have had the opportunity otherwise. They had not done the travel and not had the cultural experiences, so I feel like I've contributed to their development, not only as a teacher but as a person you know that they have I think a bigger global worldview of life and I, I hope that that's I hope that's what happened but I and I, I have a lot of ex, um, students who email me and talk to me about that experience so I'm on Facebook with some of them and they'll still talk about remember when we went to Chile and so there there's a lot of lasting impressions from this experience for them thanks did you have a question yeah uh, in relation to this cultural compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. uh, in your travels, did you notice any change about our television medium, uh, particularly programs on PBS? Are they penetrating that part of the world uh, in recent years? 
Um, boy, the TV and ch uh, the, so these the programs, media, wherever media. has the media been, I, I would hope the media has um, expanded their views of culture. I mean, one of the things is if you can't do it in person, then can some a show like that, a documentary, something provide some virtual experience? Um, I, I would hope so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, I knew Greg Kowski during his college of medicine days, and I remember he was always having book drives people yeah. distribute books. And I wonder how is it that he got linked up with Chile as opposed to someplace else? And how did he spend his days? I don't think he's still alive. Yeah, oh yeah, he's still, he just now has kind of passed the gauntlet. He's still involved in the school and his wife, he has a, a Chilean wife now and he, she's taken over as the headmaster. Um, she's actually an architect and um, uh, has a doctorate in architecture and has designed a lot of the, the schools. He, you know, he would start collecting the books because he, because of that um, medical education uh, role that he had. When he would visit the schools, he would take boxes of books with him. And I know one time he had a, an entire, he got somebody to pay for an entire container of old textbooks. We used to go over to Columbus School for Girls and they would donate for us a lot of their old textbooks and then Greg would figure out a way to get them shipped down there or, or whatever and he got someone to pay for a whole container one time. He would share those with the schools in uh, Chile uh, in particular and I don't know how he landed particularly in Concepcion but that's, um, he just kind of fell in love with the area and after, you know, if you've been there it's, it's 76, you think? Yeah. Yes, Tim? Tim? I, I'm curious about uh, your perception of the value of the homestays. And here's why. Mm -hmm. the, the vast majority of our OIA study abroad trips, uh, and I've led to several of those, um, uh, arrange for our students, by and large, to stay in commercial uh, yeah. lodging. And that's a totally different experience it for is. the students than our homestays. Yeah. And just arranging homestays, pick a country, pick a program, oh, no. and say, well, I'd like to set up, you know, two or three weeks of homestays for these kids. How in the world would you do that? Uh, and, and so that, to me, is, is a big question. I mean, the logistics of it. Uh, but, but I'm just wondering about your perspective about its relative value. Because it's one thing to stay in a hotel, right. it's another thing to stay with a family and mm -hmm. have somebody laundry your underwear. Right. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that's part of the important immersion piece to this particular study abroad. I, um, I know that working through the university maybe locally, they might be able to assist you. We actually had the eighth graders from Thomas Jefferson School came to Dublin. They, they came, they bring the, the students back, they take a trip to Washington, D.C., and then they do a homestay. The students, I think, homestayed for two weeks. And so that, I worked with the counselors at the high school because they were eighth graders, we put them with ninth grade students, um, families. So the counselor just contacted all the ninth grade parents and said, does anyone want to house a student for two weeks? And um, we had the students all, all over the city of Dublin and they got to have their American, ex North American experience. Um, so it, it, you need somebody, you need a point person, whether it's another school or somebody who can have contacts with people in some way to do that home stay. But I agree with you because I think the hotel makes it more like vacation. You know, it's not quite the, it's, it's that tourist kind of view. Now some trips, that's the only way to do it. But in this case, it's, a, it's an important piece of the trip is that immersion with the family and really understanding the deep culture. Do we need to stop? I think we do. Thank you very much. I have <laughs>
to serve both on the steering committee for the Emeritus Academy, but also to give lectures. And we are at a point now where we need to plan for next year's lecture series. And if you would like to give a lecture, uh, or even if you're not quite sure, uh, please let us know and let us know what the topic would be. Uh, I, I marvel at the variety of the topics and the quality of the talks, and I think you probably do too in, in the ones that you're able to attend. So please let us know, and please let us know very quickly. But thank you again for coming. Uh, Mary Jo will be around, I think. If you have questions, please come up and, and ask her. Thank you.